Okay, welcome to our first video uh, for the BIST Geography Department YouTube channel. This one's going to look at uh, Year 11 feedback and in particular how you can actually answer your mock questions better and try and identify where you've gone wrong. Now before we actually do that, it's worth just quickly uh, stopping for a second and actually thinking about how best to use this video. So the first piece of advice is it's quite a long video, so don't actually spend time on the bits that you've got right, focus on the bits you've got wrong. The second bit is what would suggest you stop um, before you start each question. Have a look, see if you can actually work out what you're actually trying to do. Uh, what is it you need to do better? What has it got wrong? Did you just misread the question? Is there specific bits you just didn't develop things? If you can do that yourself, then actually that's far more powerful than listening to me explain what you've gone wrong. Either way, what you do need to do is rewrite your answer so you've got full marks. Now, the best way of doing this is to use full sentences uh, and actually do it like you were doing the exam. If you've got lots to get done, then it might actually be that sort of what I would call detailed notes. Now, they'll look something like this. Now, a couple of things when we go through this, we'll see the common mistakes. One is that people are not including specific facts, that sort of knowledge. So where possible, include those, include facts, figures, places. And then the second thing that's often missing is the development. This means that as a consequence. So what you see here is I may have written it in note form and I've just used little arrows to represent that. This means that or as a consequence. But it's getting that developed form down is really important. So don't just write one or two facts down. What you have to do is you have to actually include the uh, that developed idea. Next, have a think about um, what it is you need to do. You may need to listen to the video one or two times. So you can pause it so you can actually look at the information on the screen. You can rewind it. That's absolutely fine. So be prepared. The great advantage of a video is that rather than the teacher goes through it once, and if you've missed it, you've missed it. This way you can go back as many times as you want. And finally, just as important, perhaps even more important than the actual information you need to get the answers is the exam technique. Get the exam technique right, and it makes next exam much easier. So don't just write down the answers, listen and think about what it is you can do in terms of exam technique that's going to make things better. So with that, let's start having a look at the questions. Okay, so this is question 1.1 uh, and 1.2. What you'll notice on these slides is I have put down the uh, code here. This links to your PLC and your knowledge organizers. So if you want to, a good thing to do would actually have your uh, PLC in front of you and you can do in the red, amber, uh, green. So anyway, let's get straight into it. And the first couple are quite short. Uh, so number one, uh, which of the following statements is true? It says shade one circle only. If we have a look, we can see that all active volcanoes occur along plate margins. Well, we can see that's not necessarily true. If we have a look here, we can see active volcanoes not next to it. There are more active volcanoes along constructive margins and destructive margins. Well, again, if we go down here, we can see there are a few on constructive, but the vast majority are on destructive. There are many active volcanoes found around the edge of the Pacific Ocean. And actually, that is true. This is called the ring of fire because it's a whole range of destructive plate boundaries. The next question, uh, so the answer to that one is C. The next question says, describe the movement of plates along plate margin X. Well, have a look here. We can see X is a destructive plate margin. And it's probably worth having a look at this diagram down here. And what you can see is what's happening in destructive plate margin. Destructive plate margin is when two plates move towards each other. One of them is ocean crust. And that ocean crust is denser uh, than the light continental crust, moves towards the continental crust, and is pushed down and subducted. And what you can see is that basically what they're looking for is this idea of the plates moving towards each other, colliding, uh, this idea that the plates are subducted under, or the ocean crust is subducted, or the ocean fl floor is moving under continental plates. Okay, so that's all it was looking for in that one. Now, in this question, uh, this is 1.3, it's asking you to do a bit of maths. So you've got some information. It tells you that if you look over here, it tells you that the rate of movement is 2.5 centimetres per year. And the question is, how long would it go to 100 metres? Well, to do this, the problem you've got here is that this is in centimetres, this is in metres. So the first step is convert the metres into centimetres. Just do that by times in 100. Once you've got the number of centimetres, we know it's 2.5 centimetres a year so we do the centimetres the distance in centimetres 
divided by 2.5 and that equals 4,000. So that's how we work that one out. The only tricky bit here is actually getting the conversion of the meters into centimeters. Okay, so now we're on to uh, question uh, 1.4. Now this is a harder question, okay, it's six marks. And when you get six marks, and you can see the number of marks here, what that means is you're now dealing with leveled answers. In fact, there's three levels here, it's basic, clear, and detail. We want you to be into detail. And the question is asking you to suggest how plate movements cause tectonic hazards in Iceland. So there's two parts to this, really. First of all, what's the plate movement doing? And secondly, how does that cause earthquakes and volcanoes? So to me, part of this story is basically this diagram here. So let's have a look at it. So first of all, we've got the plates moving apart from each other. It's what's called a divergent plate margin, a constructive plate margin. Because the plates are moving apart, that leaves a hole. And you can see that hole basically in the middle here. So mid-ocean ridge, or uh, in this case, a volcanic vent. As the plates move apart, the mantle is going to rise uh, and fill up that gap. As it rises, it melts and that will form volcanoes. Now, once you've got those volcanoes, you've probably got about two marks now. You need to explain how those volcanoes cause uh, problems. So you know, that would be lava flows, that would be explosions, that would be uh, ash. Uh, this is in Iceland, so ice can melt and that can cause uh, flooding or what we sometimes know, so they cause enough mud, it's called lahars. So this whole host, and you can see the information over here in the sort of mark scheme that can be uh, formed. Secondly, you can then think about, well, secondary effects. Okay, or, um, and for example, if you've got ash that can destroy farmland. So in extreme cases, that can cause famine. Um, more likely, farmers can go bust. Um, ash can make it difficult to drive. There's more likely to be road accidents. Um, ash can actually build up on houses and they can collapse and that can kill people. So you can take um, that you know, idea of, of volcano, explain why volcanoes form, explain how they actually cause hazards. And remember the key word here is hazards. The second thing is earthquakes. Now earthquakes tend to be minor and basically they're formed because as the plates are moving apart, they're effectively pulling away at each other and that forms minor earthquakes but quite shallow ones. It can be up to six on the Richter scale and that means that there can be some damage to buildings if not properly done. So with this one the answer is plates move apart, mantle rises, mantle melts to form volcanoes, volcanoes have all these other hazards, the ash, the, the lava, the melting ice and small earthquakes cause which can cause problems. Some marks for the actual explaining why, why it happens, some marks for the hazards. Okay, so it'd be worth stopping, having a look at the, the sort of content and the mark scheme and having a go at that one. Okay, so now we come on to 1.5. Now 1.5 is a pretty typical graph question. You've got these four options down here. Now, before you even start answering this, make sure you've looked at the graph. Look at what the labels are. So year at the bottom, you've got uh, temperature above and below average on this side. But you've also got this here. So instantly I'm thinking something to do with hottest years must be important. If you look at these, what you'll see is that very quickly, A, the early 1940s, well, that's not true, it's above the average. B, global temperatures showed a steady increase between 1940 and 1980, well, that's not true. Uh, C, the 15 hottest years. Now, isn't that interesting? 15 hottest years here, there's a question about it. And if I look, what I actually see is that's true. So the clue here was basically look at the key. Examiners won't put information like this for no reason whatsoever, so it's probably going to come up here. 1.6 then is give one natural cause of changes in global temperatures. And basically what you need to know is um, what causes global temperature variation that isn't linked to pollution. Okay, so pollution or melting ice, anything like that's caused by humans, that can't go in there. And basically there's a number of possible ones, you can see them over here. Uh, sunspots, this is to do with the sun sometimes uh, being uh, hotter, basically, and emitting more radiation. Sometimes when it's got sunspots, it's cooler and there's less radiation. Uh, volcanic eruptions can produce ash in the atmosphere. 
the reason we have ice ages is because the Earth's orbit isn't uh, perfectly the same. It varies. Sometimes the Earth is further away, sometimes it's nearer. And we call those variations Earth orbit uh, Milankovitch cycles. And it's actually those that trigger ice ages, in fact. And the other thing that can cause it, and think about the dinosaurs being wiped out, would be meteorite impacts. That's just a kind of knowledge thing that you've just got to know, I'm afraid. Okay, so now we come on to 1.7 and 1.8. 1.7 give two pieces of evidence other than the change in global temperatures that show climate change is taking place. Uh, so this is basically the effects of climate change. So things that could actually be there uh, would be, uh, for example, um, rising sea levels, retreating glaciers, melting ice caps, increased desertification, or you could look at long-term evidence that would include things like ice cores and um, coral reefs, for example, where they can look at the oxygen isotopes in them. But the obvious things here would be melting ice caps and rising sea levels. 1.8 is, again, a more detailed question. It's got four marks, it's explain. And it's worth just looking at the command word. As soon as you see explain, what that means you need to do is you need to give reasons and then develop them. Probably two points, each one developed should be enough. Aim for three if you can. The other thing about this, and it's worth just highlighting this, is that if you have a look, it says the use of fossil fuels, oh, it's a bit dark, and changes in agriculture. So one point has to be about the fossil fuels. See if that makes it any better. No, it doesn't. One has to be about the agriculture. If you just write about fossil fuels, you're only going to get two marks. OK, so what we can do is we can have a look down here and we can see uh, that what we've got here is uh, increase in fossil fuels. That's going to be linked to uh, transport, manufacturing, home. Uh, the key point about this is fossil fuels and burnt release CO2. CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It traps the heat trying to escape from the earth and causes global warming. If we look at agriculture, then actually what we're doing here is we're looking at increased agricultural production. Two things in particular are very bad for causing that, and that's rice, paddy fields, and cows. Both lead to an increase in methane. Methane is a particularly powerful greenhouse gas, uh, 20 times more powerful than CO2, uh, and that's again going to increase climate change. Another thing to consider is deforestation. If you're cutting down trees to grow farmland, uh, for example, burning in the Amazon, that's going to release CO2. And again, it's a greenhouse gas that's going to make things worse. Now we come on to looking at tropical storms and hurricanes and, and typhoons. And uh, this questions uh, 1.9, 1.10, 1.11 all relate to uh, this particular sort of thing over here. It's worth having a look at the title, a map showing the track of Hurricane Irma. Uh, that's quite useful because when we look at the questions, what we'll actually see is uh, how that's helpful. So 1.9, using figure four, describe the track of Hurricane Irma. Now it's a describe question. That means you just have to say what you can see. Now the track is basically the path, and this is the path here. Now what the examiner is looking for is compass directions and places and possibly dates as well. So really the perfect answer would be it starts in the Atlantic Ocean and it moves west or you could possibly say uh, sort of northwest I suppose, more, more west than north, uh, up until September the 9th um, when it's to the north of Cuba and then it moves northwards over Florida uh, until September the 12th and that's describing the track. The track basically means the path. Then question 1.1, what happened to the wind speed? Well, again, have a look here. We can see it's brown over here, it's blue over here. We look at this key, uh, the key here. Blue is category one, 119, 153 kilometers an hour. Brown is 252. So it's very simple, it's gone down. Uh, 1.11, okay, uh, give one reason why the wind speed of tropical storm uh, may change. Well, there's two reasons really, one, hurricane gets its uh, energy 
from uh, hot water over 27 degrees Celsius in the ocean. If you take the water away, it has no energy source. And secondly, uh, the land, buildings, mountains create friction that's going to slow the hurricane down. Now, 1.12 is the first of the sort of mini essay questions. Uh, what you might want to do at this point is actually stop, uh, just have a look at the information, look at the, uh, the feedback that's, that's here. With these types of questions, we're after extended and developed points. And this one in particular, the first mini essay, is always going to be the most important because not only is it worth nine marks, you get the additional three spag marks. Nowhere else in this exam paper do you get those three spag marks. So this of all the questions is the one to get right. Now, what often happens with these nine, nine mark questions is you'll get given information. You've got written information here, you've got a photo here. And then let's have a look at what the question is. So if we look at the question, what we'll see is command word is assess, assess the extent. Now that's really important to understand. What that means is it's asking you to actually explain how bad it was. And again, it's got some good advice if you look up here. Let me just highlight it up here. So it talks about here, your idea is to use phrases like slight, limited, um, relative importance, what's worse. So at the top end, you need to say, is it worse on people or the environment, or is it appalling on, on both of them? In simple terms, what you have to do is you have to say how it affects people, how it affects the environment. But there's another part of this question to make it extra complicated. Is that this bit down here? It says use figure five and an example you've studied. So you have to, if you want to get top marks, you have to use the information that's given to you, but also your own knowledge. And the likelihood is that'll be Typhoon Haiyan. So Let's have a think about what there is in this photo to start with and this text here that could be useful. And if we have a look, what we'll see is, well, let's start with the text first of all. Uh, so, hit several islands of the Caribbean, devastating consequences of local population, eight deaths, so we've got some uh, effects there. Uh, international, destroyed the international airport and the harbour, been seriously damaged. So that means that it's clearly going to be difficult to get in or out or get food or aid in or out. And then it's obviously affected the infrastructure. So power, running water, most communications have been knocked out by the powerful storm. So already I've identified three impacts here. Now, if I can describe three impacts and I can explain them, that's four or five marks. I'm already halfway there. Then I've actually got the picture here. And again, there's clues in here as well. First thing I'll notice is if I have a look down here, I can see all of these shipping containers have been damaged. That's going to be bad for industry. That's going to be bad for the roads that they're blocking. You can probably also notice if you have a look, there's evidence down here of some landslides. So again, some environmental impacts. You've also got widespread flooding over here. So just in this photo alone, I can identify five or six impacts. So start off with that. Let's have a look at how I'd think about developing those points. So let's go and have a look at uh, how we can develop those, but also how we can include Typhoon Haiyan. So what we've got here is um, just basically me trying to pick out the sort of information I would expect. And what you'll notice is that I've done this in note form. So what we've got is I, by and large, got the sort of impact if you like and then I've used one of the little arrows that means this means that. So for example eight people dead in Hurricane Irma is going to cause emotional trauma. You know, if that's your father, your mother, your sister, you, you, it's going to cause upset. Uh, the airport and the port have been destroyed. Well that's going to mean it's hard to evacuate, hard to get emergency aid in, hard to carry on trading. That's going to cause unemployment, poverty, people are going to be starving. There's no power, well there can't be any factories. People will lose their jobs. Uh, there's no water. That means there's going to be the spread of disease. People are going to get sick of waterborne diseases like cholera or whatever. Uh, now, the blue represents the impact on people. The green, remember this is a two-part question, 
it was people and the environment. So we also need to make sure that we're looking at the environment side. And environmentally, we picked out widespread flooding. Well, that means homes and habitats are going to be destroyed. We've identified landslides as an environmental aspect, which is going to block roads. Again, links back to people, perhaps. If we look at Typhoon Haiyan, then actually we can identify some similarities. Now, I wouldn't necessarily repeat this, but I'd link them together. So Typhoon Haiyan, far more people dead, far more emotional trauma. 130,000 homes destroyed, vast numbers homeless. Um, coastal erosion was widespread. Trees were destroyed by the strong winds. Again, environmental. Uh, again, widespread flooding, contamination of water supplies. And basically, if you want to get top mark, you then need to have that evaluation. And probably evaluation is it can have a substantial impact on people and the environment. But what's going to control it is the size of the storm. So Typhoon Haiyan was an even more powerful storm than Hurricane Irma, so it did more damage. I suppose another piece of evaluation is how well protected, how developed the country is, will also impact it. And possibly there's an argument that if you look, the sort of human impact on people is worse than the environmental stuff. But again, say what the problem is, okay? These are the impacts, these are why they were bad. Get into the habit of having that this means that as a consequence and try and use those evaluative words if you can. So I'd certainly have a, a good you know, stop here. Give yourself a good five or six minutes at getting a really good answer. Even if it's only in bullet points like this, make sure you can actually develop those answers. So now we come on to the economic world. And it starts off with a, a table of data. And we've got this data here. And question 2.1, calculate the median value for the GNI. Now, certainly in my group, quite a few people got median and mean confused. Median is the middle value. So the way to do this is start at uh, the top or the bottom. There's 11 here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So what we're going to want is the sixth one. So I'm simply going to start with the highest. That seems to be the highest. I'm going to cross it out. Next highest, 2, 3, four, five, and the sixth one is going to be my answer. So the answer then is going to be Argentina. Now, it's worth just noticing, if you look down here, even if you get it wrong, if there's evidence of you trying to do it, you're going to get one part mark. So it's worth actually doing your workings. Uh, that way, you actually get the marks. Okay, so let's move on. Right, so 2.2 says suggest one reason why GNI per person varies between the countries shown. Um, for me, the obvious answer would be some countries have more industry, more tertiary based services, which add more to GNI. Some countries have high level of primary, which would reduce the amount of GNI. Actually, I was quite surprised when I actually found some of the answers you could have could be as simple as um, Haiti has lower GNI because it's a poorly developed economy. Um, so actually just simply saying some countries are poorer. Um, but the other thing through this is that you should make reference to figure five if you're a named country. Okay, so it does say countries shown in figure six and oh, figure five actually, sorry, I can't read that. So it's important you've read the question. Uh, certainly, I think I've been a tad generous in marking some of these, but the important bit is that there's evidence you've linked to it. Right, next, 2.3. One disadvantage of using economic measure, okay, such as GNI. So what this wants you to do is, well, there's two ways of looking at this. You can look at it by basically saying that development's really complicated and economic development is only one aspect of it. So one answer is that it doesn't take into account the sort of social aspects of uh, development and therefore can't actually uh, be a true measure of development. The other way of looking at this is basically the problems associated with it. Okay, so it tends to be an average per person. Okay, so it doesn't allow for the fact that there might be a few billionaires and everyone else is dirt poor. Um, or the other problem with this is that they're in US dollars and they don't take into account uh, just relative spending. The fact that $100 in America 
might get you a few bits and bobs, but in India or Haiti, it'll get you tons. So the idea of the cost of living varies. Okay, um, so that's just something to bear in mind. You're either criticizing it because only looking at one aspect, or you're looking at the, the problems. Other issues could include just how hard it is for low income countries to actually measure GNI and they have to estimate it. So I suppose there's other factors as well. Now we come on to um, 2.4. Now I thought this is a really hard question. Um, and actually what's hard about it is that uh, you have to suggest how the growth of tourism uh, in an LIC or an NE might help reduce the development gap. And it gives you this diagram. And basically what you've got to do is talk about the diagram, but you don't really get points for just repeating what's there. You may get one or two if you're lucky, but actually, um, you know, we're just basically saying that, look, this is something that is, you know, creates taxes or whatever. You're not going to get more than one or two marks if you're very lucky. So what's the key thing? Well, it does say using figure six and your own understanding. So in a perfect world, you'd actually be linking into what you know about tourism in Tanzania, as well as uh, looking here. Um, and between the two, hopefully you'll get something. So basically what's going on here? Well, this process where you've got a sort of circle going on, people get getting jobs, industry being built, people getting more money, other businesses uh, doing well, uh, more taxes, more people being employed. This is what's known as the multiplier effect. So the first thing I would say is that tourism is generating a multiplier effect. Second thing I would say is, well, what jobs is it creating? It's creating tertiary jobs. These are service jobs. These tend to be better paid than primary jobs. So it's reducing the number of people that are in primary farming jobs. It's increasing the, uh, the spending power of those people. If people have got more money, then actually they can spend that money on better health care. They can spend it on better education. That's going to improve the development of the country. So again, I can take this point here and I can develop it. The other thing, okay, um, I would say is it's increasing taxes. Now this says increase income for government spending, but it doesn't say what the government spending is on. So again, I would talk about how that could actually be spent on better education, more qualified people, means in the long term the country will earn more money, better health care, again reducing the number of people are ill, improvements in infrastructure, building new ports, railways, which is going to be good for industry. So to really get top marks, what you need to do is you need to take these points and explain them. If you only just repeat them, you're just going to end up with one or two marks. So that's the trick there. And to remember this idea of when wealth is creating more wealth, okay, which is any good development, is called a multiplier effect. So now we move on to uh, 1.5 or 2.5, sorry. And this is really simple. It, it's almost uh, made harder because it's so simple. You simply have to read this and you simply have to say one problem or two problems, sorry. You know, lack of transport, travel slow, limited health care, you know, 22,000 plus people per clinic. So it should be nice and easy. Okay, the important thing where people have gone wrong is they've kind of said the same thing twice. You should try and avoid that. But that's relatively straightforward. Now, 2.6 ask you about intermediate technology. Now, intermediate technology, as it says over here, these bullet points over here, is simple and affordable. Uh, it's about providing simple machines, tools that local people can develop uh, their own businesses with and earn money. It involves local communities, bottom-up development. Uh, it tends to use local um, produce or local materials. It can be easily managed and repaired by local people. Um, so you need something like that. And I just thought I'd include a couple of photos just to show you what inter how simple intermediate technology can be. So this is what's known as a freestone pot. It's commonly used in large parts of Africa, and it's one of the most destructive things in the world. There's wood burning underneath here. 80% of the heat escapes, so you have to cut down a huge amount of wood to heat this pot up. Here, you've got what's called a GECO stove. It's a, basically a wood burning uh, stove. Okay, Actually, in this, 80% of the heat keeps into the stove, 
Uh, in fact, the wood normally goes in here. 20% um, escapes, so you need five times less wood. Five times less wood. It can't go wrong. It's cast iron. It's very simple. Uh, local iron uh, blacksmiths can make it. Can be repaired if need be. Massively reduces the amount of wood, and it's a great way of trying to preserve the environment. So that's you know, that's how simple economic um, sorry, intermediate technology can look like. Okay, so now we get to 2.7, and here you have to outline one way. Now it's worth just thinking about what the word outline means. It means tell me how they do it and give me a little bit of development. Okay, uh, really what we want to know is um, what aid money has been given, how's it been spent, what's been spent on. So if you have a look down over here, the sort of best answers, uh, if we look down here, UK has given 350 million quid to Pakistan, which is spent on improving education facilities. That would be a perfect answer. One mark for they've got given the money, one mark for they've improved education facilities. And actually, for you, you should really be using uh, Nigeria as your example. And if you have a look over here, it could be Action Aid have uh, given money to improve health cares. This is reduced and, and uh, anti mosquito nets. This is uh, reduced the, the spread of HIV, AIDS, and malaria. Okay, or it could be uh, Nigeria receives five billion pounds a year in aid, much of it from the UK government. This is spent on uh, hospitals and uh, training teachers, which is improving education. One mark for giving the money, one mark for the uh, improvement. Now, we come to a six mark question uh, in 2.8. Now, again, read the question carefully. It says, using a case study of an LIC on any e country. So as soon as you see that, you should be thinking Nigeria. Explain the link between transnational companies and industrial development in the country. Okay, now what this is really talking about how TNCs are impacting uh, Nigeria. But what you have to be careful about, it's really worth stressing this, the industrial development. Okay, quite a few people got into the environmental side of it. That's not actually going to get you any marks here. Okay, so what sort of things should you be including? Well, when TNCs invest, the technical name for that is called inward investment. And for example, that's led to new oil rigs, exploitation of oil, and that inward investment, that technology, that investment means that uh, Nigeria is now producing 2.7% of the world's oil. Those TNCs will teach new skills to Nigerians, allows them to set their own businesses, and that's going to encourage uh, industrial development and new Nigerian business to be set up. Uh, tax. So these TNCs are paying tax to Nigeria in total four billion pounds a year just for oil alone. That allows the government to invest in infrastructure, education, health, um, and yeah, things like power sources, roads, these sort of things are also going to encourage the development of, of industry. We come back to our old friend, um, that it's going to uh, increase people working in secondary tertiary industry. That means that the people in Nigeria are going to get richer, more money is going to be spent, those new industries are going to buy things, and that creates that positive multiplier effect, what we were talking about when we talked about tourism. And what that means is that the area becomes and other industries are set up. Okay, moving on quickly. We now come to uh, 2.9. 2.9 again is a uh, maths question. Again, you have to read it. This time, you've been asked to calculate the mean. The mean is that most common average where you add up all the numbers and you divide by the number. And again, if you see an example here from a student, uh, what he's done is very quickly, he simply added up all the numbers, bunged that into his calculator, I assume, divided by nine, because there's nine things here, and that's given him the answer of uh, 484.7, uh, which is nearest, damn it, is about right, so he's got the two marks. So again, the thing here is just to be careful between the difference between median, mean, and mode. You do need to know those for geography, and it's well worth having a calculator. Okay, we get on to the second big nine mark question. And again, I thought this is quite a hard one, but if you can unpick the question, then you should be absolutely fine. 
So this is an assess question. Okay, so what it wants to know is how important. And it's on the importance of transport improvements to the UK economy. So two ways of, of basically tackling this. At a simple level is basically tell me what the improvements are and why they're good, why they're helping. Okay, to get the very top marks, what you need to do is you need to talk about the sort of wider impacts of this. So looking through the, um, the knowledge organiser, those sort of coloured sheets, these are the sort of things that you've got there. So I would start off talking about expanding Heathrow and again this is about uh, spending 18 billion pounds building a new runway uh, it's going to allow more planes more tourists more businesses so that's the impact of it and that's obviously going to be good in economically but importantly the reason why the government wants to do this is this it's trying to keep london as one of the world cities and basically the argument is if it doesn't have good air links it can't be one of the great world cities um you can talk about channel tunnel uh, Channel Tunnel allows direct link to Paris and to Europe. It's good for tourism, good for industry, transport of goods and things like that. It's about developing trade links with other countries. And again, that's important for the UK economy. You could talk about High Speed 2. Now, this is the, the fast rail link they're trying to build to the north. Now, it's being built at the moment, hasn't been built. Cost 50 billion quid, so if you want to be really evaluative, you can actually talk about the fact it's incredibly expensive but it is about trying to reduce the north-south divide so again you can say that it's, in the, you know, it's, it's about trying to reduce that regional disparity and trying to increase the wealth of poorer areas in the north and finally you've got the government road building strategy which is about producing new roads trying to reduce traffic jams that reduces the amount of money lost of vehicles and lorries and goods stuck in jams and it's trying to improve access to key cities again trying to encourage trade and, and transport so that would be the main part i might also just mention the fact that actually with the internet improve, improvements in transport are probably becoming less important so if you wanted to you could just you know, argue the other way and go from there okay let's move on so now we come to the coastal questions uh, coastal questions um, and the river questions they tend to be shorter sections um, but they also in this case tend to have quite a bit of map skills now what you need to be able to do here is you need to be able to do four figure grid references there weren't any six figure grid references uh, you shouldn't assume that won't be the case in your exam uh, let's have a look at 3.1 3.1 says using figure 10 give the four figure reference for headland cliffs shade one circle only now it's really important that you remember that with four figure grid references it is always along the corridor and up the stairs so if we take this pink one here going along the corridor it's 46 and then up the stairs is 43 and it's always the bottom left hand corner that we use the numbers for so that whole square is 46 43 and if we look at that what we can see is that there's a steep valley there's a river there's a bit of a village there but there's no headlands then we can look at 46 43 so it was 46 43 so we can have a look at 45 42 45 come up to 42 so it's this yellowy one and again i can see some sand i can see a toilet but i can't see any headlands then i've got 42 40 42 40 i look at this and suddenly this is what i mean by headland a bit of rock juts out into the sea and it looks like it's got some cliffs that's what these sort of black lines sort of gray bits mean so it's obviously that one right then what i can do is i can move on and have a look at 3.2 now 3.2 says four three three nine so four three three nine so it's this one here remember it's the bottom left hand corner and it says which of the following is not shown an area of sand dunes well it says dunes there so it's clearly not that one a rocky wave cut platform now in the booklet you were given is a key in fact you can tear that booklet out no one actually does but you can do if you want to and you'll see that if you look at that that is the key for a wave cut platform 
So it's got a wave cut platform. I mentioned that because you need that later on. A wide sandy beach, yeah, sandy beach. The only thing that isn't there is a spit. Now you may not know what a spit is. A spit is a sort of beach that goes out into the sea. But by process of elimination, I can show it isn't the other three. So it has to be a spit. Now, 3.3 wanted you to actually look at the uh, size of the beach. And first things first, you need to measure the length from X to Y, uh, and then an approximate width of the sand. Now, once you've done that, once you've measured that with a ruler or a bit of paper even, your next job is to put that on the scale. And you can see here, I've copied it across. I'm starting um, here, just and don't, yeah, basically these are kilometers apart so what i'll notice is one two so from there to there is one there to there is another one so that's two three so it's three in a little bit the other way i can do this is i can use the two centimeters to one kilometer and if i actually measure that distance okay what i will notice is that it's 6.6 centimeters okay and if i use that that will equal 3.3 kilometers too. Likewise, I can do the same with the blue line here. I can measure here. Okay, and again, I just picked a random place, put it on here. This time, I'm coming back this way. I've put it on the zero kilometers. These little marks here are 100 meters. And if you look, it's just over 400 meters. So therefore, the beach length is 3.3 kilometers and about 0.4 kilometers width. So again, it's just using the scale there. You can just practice that. Now, when we get on to 3.4, again, a bit of exam technique, okay? It says, using figure 10 suggests one reason. Now, first of all, what does suggest mean? Suggest means give an idea that could be true. It doesn't matter if it is, as long as it makes sense, you're going to get a mark. Using figure 10 basically means that the answer is here somewhere. Now, we know because we saw it in the previous question, that dunes are located there. So, and the other thing is that it's given me another clue if I have a look here. It's called them sand dunes. So actually, what I'm looking for is something that's gonna call sand dunes. Well, you know, even if I don't know how sand dunes fall, and sand dunes fall, the sand is blown on shore um, and basically piles up on a gently sloping slope. Even if I don't know that, it's got the clue sand, and I can see a load of sand here. So, yeah, the first thing is that actually, the obvious answer is that the reason it's good for sand dunes is that there are large sandy beaches. Okay, the next thing to think about is actually the direction of the wind. So, yeah, most wind in this country comes from the west or the southwest. This is a west facing beach, so the wind will be pushing the sand up the beach onto the dunes. Other things you might want to consider is that there's a gentle slope and there's you know, material here on the cliffs which can be eroded to produce the sand. But the obvious answer is it's next to a large sandy beach. Okay, now we come on to uh, 3.5, and this one asked you to actually have a look at the uh, picture here and identify what it was and it's Z you've been asked to identify. Now what's really interesting is a number you were actually able to identify the headland uh, and actually name it but what I didn't see evidence of was people going back to the map and looking at what that was and if you go back a couple of questions so back when we we're doing some of the map work you'll notice it was a wave cut platform that was mentioned. So again, they've given you a clue. Now you can't guarantee they're always gonna give you a clue. So it's worth actually knowing your features. And since most people got this wrong, I thought it was actually quite worthwhile just talking about how it forms. And basically how it forms is that these cliffs here are in retreat. So the cliffs were here, they get eroded at the base to form a wave cut notch. That gets so big, the cliffs collapse and the cliff retreats. What's left behind at, sea, at tide level is basically a flat rocky bit called a wave cut platform. And because this has been eroded, any sand's removed. So you didn't need to know this for this particular question, they were just checking you could recognize it. 
but just in case it comes up in the, the proper exam, it's worth just thinking about how it's evolved. Now, when we get to 3.6, what we're doing is we're looking at how headlands and bays form. And it's worth just unpicking the question. First of all, it's explain. That means you can't just say what happens, you've got to explain why it happens. And then it's looking at headlands and bays, okay, and how they would change over time. So there's quite a bit to this question. It's probably worth just having a look over here and having a look at what it is that the examiner wants you to actually include. Uh, and if you look down here, it's about understanding of the interrelationship of coastal environments and processes, explanations are developed. Uh, equally important, it's about having a look at this information here. If you want to pause it for a second, just read this, you can do. But what I'll do in a second is I'll show you a diagram that explains it quite well. So this is the diagram that I was talking about, and it's worth just going through uh, the sort of different stages. And it's worth remembering that a really good labelled diagram can get you full marks. So we'll start with stage one. And importantly, what you've got here is what's called a discordant coastline. So a discordant coastline is one where basically you have got uh, soft and hard rock um, in layers. Now, what will happen is that there will be erosion of that coastline. The soft rocks will be eroded more rapidly than the hard rocks um, and therefore they will retreat more. Now, a really good tip here is when you use the word erosion, talk about the types of erosion. Um, the two that normally be appropriate is hydraulic action, which is the force of the waves uh, or the river, and attrition, which is when the river or the waves in this case have got stones in scratching at the thing. That's going to cause the cliff to retreat. Once the soft rocks have eroded more, they'll form bays, while the headlands will tend to be formed on the, the harder rock. Now, once you've got headlands, the next thing that will happen is that because they're sticking out into the sea, that's where erosion will be focused. Bits of the headland will get broken off. And what will happen is that sand will get pushed into the bays, which tend to be protected, and you tend to get deposition on the bays to form beaches. Okay, so that's the, the sort of story of headlands and bays. Now we come on to the final uh, sort of question, uh, looking at coastal uh, processes. And this one's looking at coastal management. Now, again, it's worth unpicking the question. So coastal management schemes, okay, so it's talking about how you protect it, are effective in protecting the coastline uh, from physical processes. Physical processes, it probably means erosion and flooding. And again, you can stop here and have a look at the different information. What we're under after, if you look at the mark scheme, is a thorough understanding of coastal management strategies and some way of showing how they're effective. Okay, uh, this idea of AO3, which is about judgment. Okay, can you justify whether they're effective or not, or are they too expensive, or do they not work? Again, it might well be worth just stopping for a second and having that this information, but I'll talk you through a sort of table in a second. Um, that's a bit simpler than this, but perhaps not quite as detailed. Okay, so this is the table I was talking about, and this is kind of in my head how I'd answer the question. So what I've done here is I've identified four different things that you've looked at. Uh, I've said groins at Holderness, but also you've looked at them at Bournemouth. Uh, sea walls, rock armour, again Holderness, uh, and beach nourishment, which is where they pile sand onto the beach. And really what I would do is I would simply um, use this table to structure my answer. So I would start off by talking about groins, so where they were, explain how they work. They work by trapping sand that's been moved by longshore drift, building up a large beach, and that beach absorbs the force of the waves and reduces erosion. Uh, the beach is good for tourism, so obviously reducing the risk of flooding and uh, coastal erosion, but it does have some negatives. So in uh, Holderness, for example, you may well have looked at how they've detected Mapleton, but it caused worse erosion down, down drift 
i.e. where the drift of the sand's going. And the technical name for this, and it's genuinely a, a technical term, is terminal groin syndrome, which unfortunately makes me laugh every time, but there you go. Um, right, the most expensive option is sea walls. And here you've got a sea wall with a curve. Uh, again, how it works, absorbs and deflects the waves. And the idea of that curve is spins the, the wave around. Uh, again, advantage can be the most effective, certainly to provide reassurance for locals. It might improve house prices, for example. But some real problems, exceptionally expensive, you know, a million pounds for 100 metres at least. And also can block access to the beach. You're not exactly going to get a pram down there very easily, so it could be bad for tourism. Uh, rock armour is basically giant boulders. Um, yeah, each one weighs five or six tonnes. Um, much cheaper than a seawall, but still expensive. One good thing about it is that when they actually get eroded, they just form sand, so there's no pollution. Um, but not pretty, and you know, kids tend to play on them and quite easy to break a bone or two by falling off them. The other option, these are all hard engineering options. There's a soft engineering option. Uh, and beach nourishment is a classic example of this. You basically take sand and you dump it on the beach. So it's doing the same job as the groin, but doesn't necessarily cause terminal groin syndrome. Uh, again, expand the size of the beach, absorb waves, good for tourism, provides protection. But if nothing's there to stop the sand being uh, eroded, they'll need to be replaced and be expensive in the long term. But again, remember, it's a sort of evaluative question. How effective are they? And sort of a key idea, and it's best shown up here, this example here with the terminal groin syndrome, you protect one area, you make the erosion worse. You stop sand moving down to drift. There's no sand to protect that area. The erosion rate will increase. So that's what we're after there. Okay, now we come on to uh, rivers. And basically, again, you've got some questions asking you to look at uh, the fourth of the grid reference for a floodplain. Floodplain is the flat area next to the, the river. And if you have a look, what you'll see is that that's 6304. And then you were asked to look at for map up actually. So that's uh, 6304. Again, remember it's the bottom left hand corner of the grid. And 63, it's so along the stair, along the corridor upstairs, 04. And then which of the following statements best describe the features of grid square 6205? So again, let's pull that up. 6205 is over here. And uh, again, a steeply sloping wooded area rising to over 250 metres. Well, it is steep, it is wooded, but that looks like 120 to me. Uh, a gently sloping river valley? Mm, no. Uh, a south facing slope of a stream and a small tributary flowing through woodland. And I think if you look south facing, yep, that would be the south. Woodland, small tributary. Perfect. So it's going to be C. Right, now if you have a look here, just thinking about 4.3, what you'll see here is this river is actually of decent size. Uh, it's got a relatively wide floodplain. So when we get to 4.3, how would it be different? Well, that's what we were looking at a second ago on the map. This is what it would look like in the upper course. And there's a nice thing here, uh, which shows you how rivers change from upstream. Upstream's like near the source, downstream's near the mouth. And basically, as you go downstream, any of these would get you a, an answer. The river will have bigger discharge, be more water in it. Uh, it'll get wider, it'll get deeper. Interestingly, actually, this model predicts it'll get slower. Uh, sorry, get faster as it goes downstream. Uh, that's true for most rivers. Some are faster upstream. Um, it's weird that, but it's to do with uh, friction. Basically, friction decreases. The amount of load, that's the rocks in the river, increases. The size of that load decreases, the roughness decreases, and the gradient decreases. So any of those will get your mark. And again, you'll see here. The other thing is that the uh, valley floor gets smaller. There might be waterfalls, less meanders, anything like that. In fact, you can see here, just in the distance, this is far more of a V-shaped valley. So that's what we're looking for there. Now, this one, 4.4, I thought was quite tough. OK, because it doesn't actually show X here. It shows X on the photo, but it doesn't show it on the map. So what you've got to do is you've got to work out where X is on the map, and then you've got to read the map. 
So what are the clues? Well, you've got the river meandering, so I've got that shape, and then it comes up near this sort of living bit, village, I guess. And again, what you'll notice is I can pick out the pattern. I can see that pattern, there it is getting close to that village. So point X is looking at here, just here. And if you look, what you'll notice is there's a number there. That number is 49, what's called a spot height. So the answer is actually 49 meters. If you don't know how to use spot heights, if you go up, you'll find the nearest contour line is 50 meters, but they've actually put it on a spot height there, which I guess is only fair, given it's quite difficult to work out exactly where it is. Okay, so we've calculated 4.4 and we know it's there. The next one is 4.5, describe one feature. And it's the feature at Y, it's on the inside of the meander, and that basically means it's gonna be deposition. So what we're looking for there is uh, either a slip off slope or what's called a point bar or a, a, I call it a river beach. And that leads us in quite nicely to the next question. So 4.6, it asks how do river meanders change over time? So we've already seen the inside of the meander is where you get deposition. And you get deposition because the water is slowest. The outside of the meander is you're going to get uh, the water going faster, it's deeper, so there's more uh, erosion, more hydraulic action. And then basically what this question is asking you to do is to basically talk through this story here. Now it might be worth just stopping for a second, see if you can answer it yourself. These are the key words I would be using. So I'd start off with this idea of erosion on the outside of the meander, okay, where the hydraulic action and vibration is occurring to form a river cliff. Um, and that's going to basically mean that the outside of the meanders are going to be eroded. On the inside, slower deposition of this slip off slope beach, uh, so river beach, whatever you want to call it. So you can get deposition. Now over time, what that means is, is that the meanders become tighter. And eventually, if we look here and here, what we see, the two outside of these meanders will get closer. What's called the neck of the meander will get tighter and tighter and tighter. Eventually, that river will break through. Okay, so the neck is cut off and the river will become straight. And then that leaves uh, an oxbow lake because these bits here are no longer, no longer water traveling through it, so it's deposition and that forms the oxbow lake. So, well worth that's a classic uh, exam question. That and waterfalls are the two classic ones of rivers. It's well worth stopping and making sure you can answer that. And now we come to the final question. I'm sure you'll be glad to hear that. Um, so what you've got here are two hydrographs. Now hydrographs are special graphs. They show two things. They show the discharge. Now the discharge is the amount of water traveling through the river and it's measured in cubic meters per second and they show the rainfall. And what you'll see here is that both storms are completely identical, but the discharge is very different. And importantly, what we have is what's called the lag time. Now the lag time is the period from peak rainfall, which occurs here, to peak discharge, which is, occurs here. And lag time then is that distance there. Now, what we can do is we can do the same over here. There's the peak rainfall, there's the peak discharge, and we can see the lag time is much larger. So that's what storm hydrographs are getting at. Uh, this one, this particular beck, is known as a flashy one. That's a flash flood, it happens really quickly. This one is less flashy, a slow onset. It takes longer for the water to rise. And what you have to do is look at this statement. Differences in the shape of flood hydrographs are caused by both human and physical factors. Do you agree? Now, the simple answer to this is yes. <laughs> it is both of them. And if you want to, what you can do is you can again stop here. Okay, have a look down here and you'll see all the different points. What we're after, okay, is actually trying to come up with the relative importance of this. Um, now, assuming um, that we're going for the top marks, then we should look over here. And what we're after, okay, again, 
AO2 is about knowledge and explaining uh, what factors affect it. AO3 is that application, that supported judgment. Okay, now that might be perhaps physical factors are more important in the countryside, human factors in the uh, in a city, for example, might be a really good statement to put down to get those AO3. Anyway, let's talk about how you might possibly answer this. So, okay, so let's have a look at this um, using one of my tables. Now, before we do that, actually, let's have a look at the keywords. So, keywords here, there's three things you really need to know if you want to get full marks. So, first of all, is overland flow. Overland flow is also known as surface runoff, and it's basically water traveling over the land. So, overland flow makes sense to me anyway. And basically, where you've got overland flow, and lots of it, water gets into the river quickly and the river will be, will be a flash flood. So over here, if we have a look, short lag time, lots of overland flow. Over here, longer lag time, less overland flow. So overland flow is one of those key words. The other word you need to know is infiltration. This is water soaking into the soil. Now if it goes into the soil, it won't travel over land. So the more infiltration, the better. The less infiltration, the more overland flow, the worse. And then what's going to be key to that is this idea of the surfaces. Can water soak into it? If it can't soak into it, we call it impermeable. If it can soak into it, we call it permeable. Okay, and so impermeable just when water can't soak into it. So again, go to answer this question, go through each factor. So you know, one of the most important things is about rainfall. The more rainfall uh, there is the more overland flow because simply the, the ground can waterlogged it can't infiltrate anymore so there's more overland flow that means shorter lag time um, steep slopes if it's on a steep slope then basically the water will run down really quickly if it's on a shallow slope it's more likely to collect as pools um, short slope more overland flow shorter lag time impermeable soil or rocks soil won't infiltrate the rain which means it's on the surface, more overland flow, shorter lag time, and so on. Uh, vegetation, if it's thick vegetation, then what will happen is trees will intercept the rain. So basically what this means is when it rains, you hide underneath a tree because the, the leaves will catch the rain. That's what we call interception. That slows the water down. That gives the ground more time to infiltrate. It reduces the chances of the ground becoming waterlogged. It's going to reduce overland flow. It's going to extend the uh, the lag time. And I bet my bottom dollar that if we were to look at a map of this place, there'd be loads of trees there slowing down water. Now, they are your four, if you like, physical factors, but there are some human factors in here to consider as well. So deforestation. So, for example, where trees have been cut down for building or for farmland, that's going to reduce the amount of interception and increase overland flow. And the key one, really, human influence is urbanisation. So roads, concrete are impermeable, um, water can't soak into it, so there's more overland flow. And drains, you know, drains uh, often take water straight into rivers. Uh, so the water that's coming off, uh, perhaps from houses or whatever, going into drains, going straight in, that'll massively increase the amount of uh, water in a river and reduce the lag time. Other things, farming, for example, uh, particularly if farmers go up and down hills, those ploughed fields will act like uh, those sort of furrows they create will channel the water into the river really quickly. So again, you can easily get six marks just by simply picking three or four of these off and basically um, explaining them. To get the top marks, though, I would be saying that this is absolutely key in places where there's large towns. Uh, these are more important though, perhaps where it's in a rural area. Okay, so again, make sure you've got that evaluation there. Okay, but you know, the simple answer I'm afraid is yes, but human factors are more important perhaps in built up urban areas. That might be the perfect answer to get those that really top mark. Right, well I hope that's been useful. Um, We'll put this on um, onto the YouTube page that'll be there. You can also download the past exam papers and the mark schemes from the pamphlets. Uh, it'd be really useful to know what you think about this, so give me some feedback. If this is something you want, we can do more of them. If you want me to change it, we can do, but you need to let us know. Anyway, hope that's been useful, uh, and I look forward to seeing your improved answers. Thank you so much.